so glad you're here. Um, and uh, I hope you get something, something uh, out of this meeting because if you don't, it's because your ears are stopped up. <laughs> because we have a great speaker tonight I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes. Uh, as far as uh, the door price goes, we passed tickets around. Did everybody get a ticket? Yeah, We're going to draw. Oh, Mr. Cross didn't get a ticket. We had to get a ticket to Mr. Cross. And Mr. Budo. And uh, whoever wins uh, gets this uh, children's book that was donated, uh, written by Heidi Catherine Rabe, and it's illustrated by one of our members. Angela Barfield is one of our members, and she illustrated the book. So if you need an illustrator for your book, she is available. And uh, she does real good work. Okay. So this is the door prize that we're going to draw for. All right. You'll need to separate those and put them in the back. All right, we'll get that in just a minute. The, uh, you're aware that we have uh, a, a little meeting that occurs in the middle of the month other than the Writers Guild, and it's called Gold Diggers. And uh, we're always studying something that will, a subject that will make us a better writer. And uh, the Gold Diggers will meet April the 15th on Monday at 6.30 here. And we will be discussing different ways to create a better uh, pace and flow in your work. Um, pacing, uh, uh, pacing your uh, ac the action in your story and the continuity of the flow is very critical in keeping your readers interest. So we'll be doing that. All right, great. Uh, our next meeting will be May 28th here. And um, we have, I'm sorry, May. Okay, no, April, April, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm jumping up. Um, and it'll be, uh, April's prompt is a, a memoir. And the prompt is, I still don't understand. And uh, it has to appear somewhere in the writing. Okay. Sure about that date? Yeah. Pardon? Are you sure about that date? I'm I'm gonna get the date right now April because 30th. April thirtieth. Thank you. April thirtieth. I had jumped ahead to May. We do have a May twenty eighth yeah. meeting, but I'm I'm ahead of myself. Okay, well, right. is April Gold Digger the 15th or is it the 22nd? Uh, April 15th is the, uh, is the uh, Gold Diggers. April 15th. <coughs> and at 6.30. And April 30th at 7 o'clock is our regular meeting. Okay. Sudi is not here today. I don't look like Sudi. I don't feel like Sudi. You could have fooled me. <laughs> get that man some glasses. Can we get a donation? Uh, Sudi has uh, vertigo. And uh, she had a bad attack this morning, and it caused her blood pressure to just skyrocket. She went to the hospital, and they got her blood pressure down, and she seemed to get kind of oriented where she could go back home, and she's resting. Christopher Fontenot, I, I think you met Christopher, he's been here several times, 
and he has um, taken the job of vice president and he was elected into the position and he accepted can't be here today he's got the flu um, I don't think it's the position of vice president that gave it to him but um, he did get it somewhere along the way don't know about flu he said he had a flu shot his wife did too wife had the flu and then came down with pneumonia had to go in the hospital so they're all sick over there I told them don't come don't need it okay let's see good to see you Madame Francaise uh, okay now it's time to draw is that what that rattle is all about okay all right, this young lady that's got the little uh, tool there in front of her, ask her to draw out of the bag. One, only one. And, and it can't be your daughter's. <laughs> it is four, oh, the last three. Three, four, nine. Three, four, three, nine four, is four, the nine. winner. Three, four, nine. There he is. <coughs> All right. Three, four, nine is the winner. That's Neil Bertrand is the winner. So who's got the book? Ah, oh, there it is. Congratulations. All right. All right. My ticket is for sale if anyone wants to buy it. <laughs> Ms. Jan Risher, would you stand for a second? Ms. Jan Risher is our guest speaker tonight, and I'd like to give her an introduction. She grew up in the middle of Mississippi with a family full of storytellers. She eventually made her way to Louisiana, taking the long route to get there with stops between in the mountains of Slo. Avakia, a tribal village in Bur Burkina, Burkina Faso. Faso, I know that. The hills of central Mexico, Reno, Nevada, Washington, D.C., El Paso, Texas, and more. She's been a regular columnist for three newspapers and continues to write in the Sunday column for the Lafayette Daily Advertiser. Because I just changed to the daily to the advocate. The advocate. Okay. Yay. Good move. Relief. She is the former manager editor of the Times of Acadiana, and has been a full-time teacher and owner of a public relations firm. She continues a freelance writing career, focusing primarily on business writing. She is a co-author of Team Renaissance, The Art, Science, and Politics of Great Teams. She is a graduate of Mississippi State University and makes her home in Lafayette with her husband and two daughters. Mr. Sid Salter, the Chief Communications Officer for the Mississippi State University, says, and I quote, at heart, Jan Risher is a compassionate storyteller. She writes honestly about family, home, love, mothers, work, marriage, friendships, death, and all of life's intangibles. She is a dynamic speaker, freelance writer, author, columnist, and former English teacher and world traveler. Let's give a warm welcome to Ms. Jan Risher. Algiers and other long stories short. The name of my column in the newspaper 
at the advertiser and now at the advocate is um, long story short. And so we're going to talk a little bit about memoir writing, which might lead into what you guys are going to be talking about next month. And um, a few other little things. So get started here. So um, I don't know how many of you listen to Judith Merriweather. Um, she has a talk show on KRBS. I listen to KRBS on Friday morning, to one. All right. I know Judith well and her real well. Judith has a um, show. I believe it airs on Wednesday afternoons. Two or three, I can't remember. But um, she interviewed me right when my book came out in October. And um, she actually read the book before she interviewed me, which was a treat, <laughs> and um, she she is a great interviewer. I think she does a good job, and she actually helped me figure out what the theme of my book is. So my book, this one, is a collection of newspaper columns, and I'll give you a little bit more information about that as we go. But um, she asked me if I thought that my book had a theme, and this was right when it was coming out, and we've been working editing it for about two years and um, you know I've written a column every week since February 2002 so that if you do the math that's a whole lot of columns I'm approaching a thousand columns and then my book ended up with 182 columns so I jokingly refer to it as Jan Risher's greatest hits <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Judith said that she thought that the first column in the book actually encapsulated the theme of the book. And the first column was written, I wrote it whenever my daughter was, my older daughter was three, and she was in a preschool. And this teacher um, made an assignment for the parents, which is how preschool typically goes. And um, the assignment was to, to work with your child in recognizing calling out beauty. And um, Judith went on to say that she thinks that that's really what my whole book is about, just recognizing and, and calling out the beautiful things. So I was talking to a friend of mine. I don't know how many of you guys know Roy Pettifees. Do you all know Roy? He's, a, he's an author. And um, I, I was talking to him about that earlier this week. And he said, well, Jan, that is true. You do like to call out beautiful things, but you also don't mind calling out ugly things as well. And so um, it put it in a little different perspective. So when I worked to compile this book, um, I did work with a team of editors, but I found this quote by um, St. Augustine, and I would say it's a rough translation of St. Augustine's quote, but I like it a lot, and it's, the deepest desire of the human heart is to belong, to be welcomed, to know you are seen and worthy of kindness. I'll read it one more time. The deepest desire of the human heart is to belong, to be welcomed, to know you are seen and worthy of kindness. So um, back in 2005 when Katrina happened. I was actually a reporter for the advertiser at the time. And on the Friday of Katrina, I was um, sent to the Cajun Dome. And that was, if any of you were here or, or remember, that was the day of the absolute most people at the Cajun Dome. They had the most evacuees. And some of the people estimate that there were possibly as many as 12,000 evacuees at the Cajun Dome. That way. It was just pure bedlam, it was chaos. And I was walking across the parking lot with a photographer, and I had been sent to the Cajun Dome to go interview Laura Bush, who was coming to serve lunch to evacuees. So I'm walking across the parking lot with this photographer, his name's Andrew West, and had my reporter's notebook, which I love to carry a reporter's notebook, because when you carry a reporter's notebook, and a pen, people will tell you anything. <laughs> Just remember that. And actually, you know what? If you ask and you listen, people will usually tell you almost anything. But 
But anyway, Andrew and I were walking across the parking lot, and this woman, I don't know how well you can see it. Can you see her? Yeah. Well, her name is Kiana Ruffin, and she grabbed my arm as I was walking across the parking lot. And you know, I have traveled a lot. I've actually been to 48 countries now, and I, um, most of that traveling was by myself. And I have a pretty good knock on wood sense of when something is wrong. And I knew something was wrong. So she grabs my arm and I said, What are you doing? And she said, I lost my baby. This was on Friday of that week. And I said, What do you mean you've lost your baby? She said, I had a baby right before Katrina happened on Monday, you know, Monday. And the hospital sent me home shortly after to get ready for the storm, but they kept my baby because something was wrong. And he, I'm not sure exactly what it was, but some of his levels, nothing serious, but something was slightly wrong. And she said, then on Wednesday, when the levees broke, my husband and I walked back to the hospital to get our son, newborn son, and they had evacuated the hospital. That or what? They had evacuated, evacuated the hospital. And I was like, okay. And she said, and no one could tell us where our son was. So she had a purse, so she opened up her purse, and she pulls out a piece of paper that's not a whole lot bigger than one of these tickets. And on the piece of paper, there were seven phone numbers. She said, they gave me these seven phone numbers and said he's at one of these hospitals, but I keep calling them when our phones will work and nobody has my baby. So 50 yards away, the Red Cross, I mean, I could see the Red Cross table. And I said, well, there's the Red Cross, you know. Let's go talk to them. She said, I already talked to them. They, they don't know where my baby is, they can't help me. So, I remember, Laura Bush is coming inside, I'm supposed to be talking to her, but we walk up to, this, to the Red Cross, and I start calling the numbers that were on her little piece of paper. And within 30 minutes, we found that little boy. But, which is a good thing. But this woman had been calling hospitals for three days and nobody would tell her where her son was. And I know things were broken. The whole system was broken. But how much more broken does that say the system is when a mom can't find her new baby? And someone who doesn't sound like her can. So it changed my life. It changed my life in a lot of ways, that moment did. But the main one was to recognize that those of us who have a voice, and I think you're here, <coughs> that means you have a voice that people listen to. You know, there's the responsibility that we have to people whose voices aren't heard. And secondly, not just that responsibility to speak for other people, but there's a responsibility to, to try to teach people how to have their voices be heard or help them find ways. And you know what? It may be a one-on-one -on -one thing. I'm not sure that there's a system that can work um, to do that. Yeah. But um, I'm going to stop there because I'm going to read the story in a minute and it's going to repeat some of what I told you, but I think that will be okay. And I tell you that story because if you're wondering why the name of the book is Looking to the Stars from Old Algiers, um, when Kiana Ruffin left that day, I found a volunteer who would take her to Baton Rouge to get her sign. And I never heard, I didn't know anything more about them. I didn't know where they went, never heard anything else from them. But on the 10 year anniversary of Katrina in 2015, um, I got a Facebook message from Kiana. And um, she said, 
her son really wanted to meet me. And so actually I'll stop there and I'll, I'll read that column. Um, so the reason that this book is named Looking to the Stars from Old Algiers and other long story short, my column is called Long Story Short. But um, Kiana and her family lived in Old Algiers. So I'll leave it at that and you can hear the rest of the story. hope isn't lost, and this is how I know. On Thursday, my husband and I drove to New Orleans and sat on a bench in Jackson Square, waiting. My husband didn't mind carrying the oversized gift bag that contained a small red telescope, glowing with the dark ceiling stars, and copies of A Diary of a Wimpy Kid and, Light and The Lightning Thief. I had never met the young man I bought the gifts for, but amidst all the Katrina anniversary hubbub, he was celebrating the 10-year anniversary of his birth. I wanted to celebrate with him and his mama. Every now and then, the stars align and the universe, along with everyone in it, seems to want to be certain that we keep hope alive. Thursday was one of those nights, and this was written August 30th, 2015. It was also one of those nights that makes me reconsider the ancient Chinese belief that each of us who were supposed to meet are connected by an invisible red thread, which may be long and twisty. However, if we're supposed to meet, eventually we will. Ten years ago, in the wake of Katrina, a young mother named Kiana Ruffin ended up at Lafayette's Cajun Dome as an evacuee. In the chaos of thousands of people in the Cajun Dome parking lot, Kiana grabbed me as I walked past. She's not sure why I was the one. All I know is there were lots of other people walking around and Kiana was distraught, bordering on hysterical. When she told me what was wrong, I understood why. In the course of the storm, levees breaking and hospitals evacuating, she had gotten separated from her newborn son. Someone had given her a tiny list of seven Louisiana hospitals where he might be. She had called them repeatedly, but no one knew where her son was. By the time our paths crossed, She'd been searching for him and seeking help from any and all sources for three days. Once I started making the calls and queries for her, other volunteers got involved and we were able to find the baby within an hour. We didn't call any different or magic numbers than the ones she'd already been trying, but for reasons long, complex, and sad enough to make me cry forever, when I asked the same questions trying to locate her newborn son, she had been asking for three days, we got a different answer. The baby was in Baton Rouge. A volunteer took the parents to pick him up, and the Ruffin family was gone from my life. They left me with much to consider, primarily the lesson of responsibility that those of us who have a voice have for those who don't. And that lesson was seared in my soul in a way it hadn't been previously. And for 10 years, that's where the story ended for me. Back then, when I got back to the newsroom, I wrote a news story about it with all the news of that time. The story ran on page 2A, and I never forgot their names, but searched for them to no avail. Two weeks ago, Kiana Ruffin sent me a Facebook message and told me her son really wanted to meet me. My husband and I decided to come to New Orleans and throw him a little birthday celebration. Wrapping up Katrina's most lingering story was a good way for me to mark the 10-year anniversary. The invisible red thread connecting us was definitely a long and tangled one, but Kelvin Ruffin and I finally met Thursday night. As I was planning our evening, I considered taking Kiana and Kelvin to my favorite New Orleans restaurant, Irene's. I called to make reservations and explain the circumstances of our dinner. Chef Scalco, son of owner Irene, called me back. He and I had never met either. But we had one of those conversations that restores your faith in humanity. He told me he was a dad and couldn't imagine going through what Kiana had gone through. He assured me that he and his staff would make the night one to remember and ask if he could take our photograph to hang on the wall. If you haven't been to Irene's Go, the charming little restaurant with its impeccable staff serves food so delicious that sometimes after I eat there, I dream of its red sauce. 
It's been my favorite New Orleans restaurant for years, but on Thursday night, its status moved up from there. From the moment we arrived, Chef Scalco and his team went to unheard heights to make our unlikely party of four feel special. They did little and big things all night long that still make my eyes well up. It was a night of a thousand small, beautiful things tinged with other moments of clarifying heartbreak. Things like Kiana pulling out her 10-year-old copy of the story I wrote about her search for the son, her son, that ran in the Daily Advertiser. She explained that the very tattered copy was one of her most prized possessions. She keeps it in her box of special things, but it had clearly seen better days. Things like the chef preparing cannelloni, a dish they had taken off the menu. I mentioned how much I loved it when we chatted. Things like the whole restaurant stopping to celebrate with us when they brought out a birthday cake with a tall, sparkling candle for Kelvin. And in that moment, it really felt like they were all with us, all rooting for Kiana and Kelvin. Things like Kelvin being more enamored by the sparkly thing than actually eating his cake. Things like the chef taking a photograph of our party of four to frame and put on the wall alongside the photographs of other more likely suspects. Things like Kiana and I having a real conversation about what she needs to do to get her GED. Things like Keldon telling us he wants to be a football player when he grows up and Kiana quickly telling him that he has to get an education first. Things like walking with them after dinner to meet the bus that would take them home. It was a walk that felt a lot like being Cinderella after the ball. The chef and I could do what we could do to make the night almost perfect, and it was. But the reality was that they had to go back to a life that is not an easy one. The experience of meeting Kiana 10 years ago, half of the years, made me contemplate what is necessary to teach people who don't know how to be their own best advocates to do a better job of getting people to listen to them. I am not certain a well-designed program will work. Maybe the only solution is when one end of the red thread meets the other, that we figure out how it is we can help each other. And we keep doing so until it doesn't make sense anymore. Surely we are a long way from that. In the meantime, there is a little boy near old Algiers who has a red telescope now. I hope and pray that he will continue to look toward the stars. And that is why the book is called Looking to the Stars from Old Algiers. And um, is my favorite um, story of a probably in the book, probably. I have to really think about that. But, um, you know, of course, that's not where the story ends, is it? Sadly, that night couldn't fix things, and it didn't fix things. But, um, but we keep trying to help fix things. So, got a little out of order with my um, book, but, um, and with my presentation. But, what I want to tell you is something about bibliotherapy. Have any of you ever heard of bibliotherapy? No. I hadn't either until I started um, trying to figure out what to talk about whenever I talked about my book. Well, bibliotherapy is something that I aspire to. It's called, it's a creative arts therapy that involves storytelling or the reading of specific text with the purpose of healing. And it is not a new thing. It actually started shortly after World War I, when people came back from World War I and were, you know, had what they called then shell shock. Um, so bibliotherapy, sorry, bibliotherapy uses an individual's relationship to the content of books, poetry, or other written works as therapy. Steve, you may know something about that. Sure. And it's um, been shown to be effective in the treatment of depression. And um, they've done a lot of studies about it, and it's, the results seem to indicate, indicate that the um, treatment is, and the results are long lasting. And it's often combined with writing therapy. So I know that uh, most of the time when I speak to a group of writers, you're also a group of readers. So chances are that you have probably unknowingly combined reading therapy with writing therapy, or bibliotherapy as it's called. So um, I, I thought that I would give you, we'd go straight to the writing therapy part of things. So I have written this column for now almost seven, well, no, more than 17 years. 
And so I thought about what it is, you know, how many stories do you think you have to tell? A bunch, right? Like automatically. I got 30 stories automatically, right? I did too. But when I got to about 854, sometimes you have to dig a little deeper to, to find those stories every single week. But I have nine points that I would like to share with you that I think have made me a better writer and certainly have made me um, able to identify topics to write about. And the first one is to move. Not necessarily move from one city to another or one state to another, but just move around. Go places and do things. Don't go to the same places. Go to the new restaurant. Go to the new park. Go places. You know, if you can't go far, that's okay. There are places here where you don't go. Don't always go to the same places. I think that jar in your brain is really good for you, and it triggers something. That's step one. The second step in my handy-dandy steps to writing every week, week is um, to read things. I love historical fiction. I could read historical fiction pretty much all the time except when I'm sleeping or eating. But that's a problem because I need, you know, I have to force myself to force myself not to just read the kind of book I love to read, which are just set in quaint English villages and there's a bad guy and everything gets solved and everybody's happy. That's the kind of book I love to read. With that's well written though. Um, like Ken Follett's books that we were talking about earlier. But I, I'm a member of at least two book clubs, but three other groups that force me to read other things. And guess what? It is good for me. So don't just read the same old things. Don't just read the same kind of authors. Read different things. Read authors from different places. Um, one of my, I do love to travel, and one of my favorite things to do before I go to a new place is find fiction set in those places written preferably by someone from that place. Because I think that can give you insight into a place that a guidebook just can't give you. We adopted our youngest daughter from China and before we went to China I read as many well-written Chinese fiction pieces as I could, along with lots of guidebooks. But it just gave me a really different understanding of Chinese culture. I'm not saying that I didn't have plenty to learn, because certainly I did. But um, if you want, in my opinion, from having been to China several times, if you want some insight into Chinese culture, there is a book called Waiting, W-A-I-T-I-N-G. And I think that the author's name is Li, the last name is L-I, I believe. But um, it's a, it won the National Book Award like around 2000 or something like that. So check that book out. So read different things from different people from different places who don't all look the same. It will make you a better writer. Step number three, um, look for themes. Every single week I look for themes and to look for the themes, you can't just sit down and go, oh, I need a theme. You know, you really have to find some quiet, and you have to be still, and you actually have to think. And so, the world is probably not exactly designed to look for themes these days. So you have to change that pace, and you have to go against that grain a little bit but find a place to be quiet, to be still. And just to think, you know, we, um, our Americanness sometimes makes us feel like we have to be moving to be productive. And that is not true to me. Um, step four, try to connect the dots, but don't aim for certainty. So um, 
And maybe it's just a function of age. My birthday was two days ago. I turned 55. And I, um, I was a much more sure and certain person 30 years ago, or even 20 years ago, than I am now. You know, I think that that aiming for certainty is highly overrated. So if you do all those other things, you're moving, you're reading, you find time to think, you find time to be still, then you start trying to connect those pieces, trying to find that story. And I do this every week. My deadline is on Wednesday, used to be Wednesday at midnight, now it's Thursday at 2 p.m. But I usually write Wednesday nights. Um, connecting the dots of the different places, of the different themes of what you're reading, or the different people you're speaking to, is really important. But it doesn't have to be tied up nice and neat. That's the point I'm trying to make about the not aiming for certainty. And then step five, if you're going to write a column every single week, if you're going to write anything every single week, is start typing. You might not have it all worked out. It's not all finished, not all nice and neat, but you just have to start typing. That's an easy one, an easy step to explain, at least. And then step six, and this goes to the memoir writing aspect of things, because my columns are first person, personal, and um, being honest is, is important. You, it's easy to tell the story the sanitized version, the way that things you might think should have been. But to tell the truth is a little bit harder, or it takes a little more um, experience sometimes. And um, I rigorously try to tell the whole truth in my writing. I might not tell the whole story, but everything I write is the whole truth. Um, you know, I protect people in my writing, but I, um, I, I recognize that if I read back my writing and editing, that if I start using cliches, you know, poker players have certain tells of what, where you can read their faces, maybe their eyes, or maybe their hand motion, or something they do with their glasses. Well, my tell, personally, that I figured out but when I'm not being completely honest in my writing, it's when I use a cliche. And if I'm using a cliche, I can bet there's something about that that I didn't go all the way in. So I try to dig deeper about that. Step seven. Um, if you are lucky enough to start writing and know exactly where you're going, you're I bow down to you. I am not that kind of a writer. Um, so sometimes when I'm writing, I don't know where I'm going, but I just have to have faith that the flow will come. And if I keep writing, the flow will come. And then, because I am writing you know, pieces that are usually about 750 words, they're not really that long. So once the flow starts, you got to wrap it up because they're going to edit it. Well, actually, in the way the newspapers work today, nobody really edits much, but um, it's got to be about 750 words. can't be more than that. So step eight is to edit. And my favorite way of editing is to read, read the piece aloud to someone else. Not just to myself, but read it aloud, what is on the page to someone else. And you will find what doesn't work if you do that. So read aloud, edit some more, polish it. And then step nine, in, in the essence of a weekly column, is I put a picture of Babe Ruth because it's send and repeat. I read my column a lot every week with my husband, his name is Julio, and um, sometimes Julio says, well, Jan, you can't hit a home run every week. <laughs> so, you know. Babe Ruth, what, didn't he also lead in strikeouts for a long time as well? So, um, so what was number nine? Uh, <coughs> send and repeat. Send? Send. Oh, like for me, I'm sending the newspaper column out. So, you know, wrap it up, send it, and repeat. Okay. So, because 
it's ongoing. You got to feed the beast. All right. So um, I'm going to step back just a little bit and um, talk about this book a little bit more and how we got from those nine steps to this book. Um, this book is, I don't know if you can see it from there, but this is a map of the Mississippi River. And it's a map from 1944. A man named Harold Fisk, he was a geologist, um, did a map of all the different paths of the Mississippi. So it's the evolution. And I liked it metaphorically. I'm from Mississippi. Um, I live in Louisiana, what connects Mississippi and Louisiana? Mississippi River. And I liked it just from the sense of the different paths of it because, you know, different things happen. We run up against different sandbars and we change the paths of our life. And when I was growing up in Forest, Mississippi, population 5,000, Nelda and Gary Risher, my parents, did not anticipate having a son-in-law named Julio. I'll put it that way. You know, think life changes. Life goes a different route. Life goes in ways you might not expect. But designing this cover only took about two hours. However, we spent about three weeks on this ugly cover. I don't know if you can really see it, but it looks like a Nancy Drew cover, kind of. And um, it is not very attractive, but we worked hard on it to make it this unattractive. Um, and so we were sitting there, and I knew I didn't like it. And my point in sharing this with you is to tell you, sometimes, no matter how much time you or someone else have put into it, you have to trust your gut. It did not feel right. And even after we put all that time into it, I said, ah. And then I started thinking metaphorically, and I remembered that Harold Fisk map, which is now public domain because it was printed originally in 1944, so I knew we could use it. I'm like, what if we do this? And so we just had to dump it. And sometimes when something sucks, excuse my language, but you just have to dump it. And that's what we did to come up with the cover. Question. Yes, sir. What was that window supposed to mean in that first cover? Well, it's looking to the stars from old Algiers. And so there's through a little, the window? Through, yeah, there's a little telescope. He's looking through the oh, window. Oh, I can see. Okay. So, I mean, it was very literal. And, it, you know, it, I don't know, maybe it wasn't as terrible, but once I saw this, I surely liked this a lot better. So, um, Several people have talked to me about, you know, how did the book come about? And I have written a couple of other books that weren't like this, weren't a compilation of columns. But um, the University Press and I started talking, and um, they were interested in my book. And so at first, I had to find all the columns that I'd written. And I thought, that'll be easy, you know, I got all those columns. Well, we don't think about how often we change technology. And even though I had rigorously tried to keep all my pieces in one place, I ended up, in two, for the columns that I wrote in 2002, going having to go to the UL library and finding microfilm to um, find those columns and then retyping them. And if you're wondering, yes, I did edit them a little bit. <laughs> Just because I found things that needed to be fixed. So finding all the columns ended up taking a lot more time. Even when I thought I had it, all these things had already been written. And then I had to read the columns and I, I assembled a little team of people to do that. And we started culling out the, the columns that we thought we could let go of. So, um, so I had five editors who I worked with, and then two editors at UL Press. And when it was printed, there were still girls. <laughs> so, you know, typos just happened. We, I think we fixed them all for the second printing, but it was pretty painful to find those typos. So, um, I, I say that part of my talk to say, you know, like a movie can't be made by one person, a book can rarely be published, if ever, by one person. 
And so you got to get a team on your side to help you get this done, if that is your goal. And, and I have deep gratitude to um, the people who helped me make my book. And um, I, I found this quote, it says, gratitude can transform common days into thanksgivings, turn routine jobs into joy, and change ordinary opportunities into blessings. And that's truly how I feel about the people who I had the privilege of working with to create the book that came out last fall. I mean, this was a job, but they turned it into a blessing. And a lot of my book um, goes back to my childhood. And um, I, I have a picture here of me with a bunch of kids riding bikes in Forest, Mississippi from about 1977. And um, there's a song by Dawes, and it goes a little something like this. I hope that life without a chaperone is what you thought it'd be. I hope your brother's El Camino runs forever. I hope the world sees the same person that you always were to me. And may all your favorite bands stay together. <laughs> so, so all of these people who were such a part of my life and my childhood, I read this quote the other day that said, you only see the world once in childhood. The rest is just memory. And, you know, I don't know why Cliff McKinney and Eddie McDill and Melissa Marvegio and Tammy Dobbs and Shante Jones and Sophie Smith are so important to me, because I haven't seen any of them in a decade or more. But they are still important to my worldview. And, you know, I, um, I'm grateful to them for just that kindness that they showed me as a kid. <coughs> and I found a quote that said, and this is by Ann Mar Mara Lindbergh, mother of the Lindbergh baby, wife of Charles. And it said, one can never pay in gratitude. One can only pay in kind somewhere else in life. And so for all those people who were so kind to me back then, you know, I owe it to the people who I get to be with now to repay that debt of gratitude. So um, I'll stop talking for a little bit and see what questions you have. <coughs> kind of like day forward. But uh, anyway, I wanted to ask you two questions. That, uh, the easier one would be, uh, you like historical fiction, so I was wondering if you, if you wrote a novel, a historical fiction novel, if you, or if you contemplated that. Well, um, I'm glad you asked that. <coughs> um, I haven't written a historical fiction novel, but I did just, this is something I need to add to my bio. I, last fall, I won a um, writing fellowship, and I am going to Wyoming and leave in as April of this year, and I'll be gone for a month, and I am going to try my hand at fiction. It's not going to really be historical fiction, but it's going to be all-out fiction. I got a plan. I'm going to do my bed level. Fiction, nonfiction comes very easily to me. So that's I'm not historical fiction, but I'm starting with fiction. Yeah, just, the second question is, I'm, I'm just stuck on your first story, uh -huh. which was me too. Me. And so, and also, but the <clears throat> I'm not the brightest one in here, so I apologize for this question. But and maybe this isn't the right venue. But what's the the, the undertone? of a social, it seems like there's an undertone of social justice or social injustice maybe uh, implied uh, in your story or maybe in your telling about your story. Could you expound on that a little bit this evening or would that be too much? Well, no, I don't mind. I certainly don't have an answer. But I, um, I think it's important to call out injustice. I think that it's our responsibility to do, to do that. Nothing's going to change until we shine a light on it. And I, I, I made a commitment to do what I can do along those lines. And if part of that is telling those stories, that's what I'm going to do. But I want to do more than just tell stories. In, in part of his question, mm -hmm. uh, in your 
help that you were able to give, did you just say, I'm looking for such and such a baby, or did you say, I am so and so a reporter from uh, the advertising? I did not say I'm a reporter. I looked, said, so I'm looking for this baby. Did so you finally got in touch with him? It wasn't hard. My back to your question. Uh, when you're writing, does your thoughts come to you when you put it down on paper first and then you try to write it on the computer or do you put it down on paper? I go straight to computer. Do you hand write it on, on tablet? Well, that's what I do. Yeah. I hand write it on tablet. I was in school to get my GED. And uh, my teacher, Ms. Robinson, said, you got to write, write a rough draft about what you're saying and go through it. Do you ever do that? I always, I mean, a long time ago I did, but now my rhythm works with the computer. And that's how I partially think now. Yeah. So, did you have a question back there? Anybody? Um, go ahead. I have just a comment when you were talking about the biotherapy. Bibliotherapy. Interesting because um, when my mother passed away, my, my uh, little nephew was so close to her, she was like a mom to him. And one of the things I did was make him write a journal. And it really helped him to get through, you know, that transition, that period. I am a believer in mm -hmm. the combination of bibliotherapy and writing therapy. I totally believe it can help. Yeah. That's what our teacher in school gave us to do, they, she gave us a journal and we would write a journal. Right. I started writing a journal at home. Yes. But what hospital had they delivered the baby at? Um, it was a hospital in Baton Rouge. Or I was, can't remember which one. It was not, it was not. Oh, oh in the hospital in New Orleans? Yeah. Um, people have asked me this before. It was not Turo. Um, charity? Must have been Charity. The reason I ask that, I have a friend of mine who was in charge of pediatrics at Charity at that time, and she was evacuated, so she was had been involved with this baby. But the thing is, I was in New Orleans, and I I don't blame the people who were evacuating the hospital. I think they were doing the best they could do. You know, it was it was chaos. Oh, it, it was, it was, you know, bad. it was a lesson in just how quickly this all can break down. <laughs> I was sitting in my apartment, I was sitting up in my apartment in the backlash of Katrina was sitting in Lafayette. That's how bad it was, and I'll put it on the TV and, man, them poor people, man. Um, does anybody else have another question? Yes. Just out of curiosity, when you were at Cajun Dome, did you ever get to talk to, was it Laura Bush? I did see Laura Bush, and I did ask her a question. But the most remarkable thing that happened was they were herding the reporters in this little cattle stall, basically. And unless you had a camera, you couldn't follow her. So I wasn't allowed to follow her. But all the people were hungry and they were lining up. And so I called the newspaper and I said, they are literally making these people wait while Laura Bush goes on a tour. They're not feeding the people. Even though you know, they're waiting for Laura Bush to make this ceremonial plate of food. And uh, that turned out to be the story of the day. That got more shares than pretty much anything the advertiser wrote during Katrina. <laughs> Um, so that was a funny little aside about that day. It was a crazy time. How many stories do you have in your book? There are 182. Yes. Um, what would you say to young writers as far as finding their voice and identifying with what their voice would be? Tell the truth and you're not sure about it, it is not the truth. And you gotta figure out who you are and be okay with that. So, um, yes sir. Yeah, um, UAL Press, you said is the publisher. Right. Uh, what kind of promotion and publicity did they give the book to help put it out there? Not a lot, but they, 
put it in their catalog, and they certainly helped me um, be a part of the Louisiana Book Day at the Capitol in Baton Rouge. And um, they had an event downtown, the library, I think you were there at the library, and um, you know, put it in their catalog. But I happen to own a public relations company, so we specialize in this. And um, someone who worked for me was able, you know, I'm just not real comfortable calling people and touting myself. And so someone who works for me was able to um, set up a book tour, and the book tour really sold books. So, so you basically did it you yourself. You have to do it yourself. I mean, unless you are Michelle Obama or, you know, some other celebrity, celebrity who has a book at this point, it's on you. Yeah. Yes. Where did you do your tour? I mean, in Louisiana, Mississippi, what areas did yeah, you? Yeah, I did Louisiana, Mississippi. Um, I think I've got one coming up that's going to be in Bear Hope, Alabama. And I'll probably go to El Paso, Texas, which is where I live before I move to Lafayette this summer. Actually, Monday, I'm going to Jackson, Mississippi to do one on April, on April Fool's Day. It's just a very practical question. How do you find the time to do all that write and own a company and tour and... I'm a terrible housekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> that is the truth. Truth? That is true. <laughs> yeah. The personal question, why did you go to the advocate from the habitat? <sighs> because um, at the time, I think that I think that the move of several of the reporters and columnists to the advocate, I think that has stirred something up in the advertisers reinvesting some energy. But the truth of it is, at the time, I felt like the advertiser was betraying the community. <coughs> and that Thank hurts you. my heart. <laughs> Thank you. So, but uh, I, I wish them well, and I'm glad that uh, they got a new editor. Yeah, but well. I, 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 I think that the community deserves better. My grandfather was Scranton Moton. His pictures up in the advertising. He was a city. He was the city manager and the editor back in the forties. I don't know if you remember him. His name was Scranton Moton. I do not remember him. That's when the Daily Advertiser was downtown. My dad worked for him. Yeah. You know, I worked for it when it was downtown. But one thing I will say before I um, finish up here, I've got a few more minutes, is that. I also, I think that Judith is right that that's part of what my book is about, but I think that my book is also about community and um, building community. And, um, you know, I think it's important to make critical connections to community. <coughs> so if you don't mind, I will finish up by reading one more piece. called the promise of pea gravel. I'm sorry, the promise of? Pea gravel. Oh, okay. My parents bought the house from Uncle Troy and Aunt Dolores when I was seven years old. My parents would have been in their late twenties, considerably younger than I am now, but older than I'll ever be. From our house at 722 Marion Boulevard in Forest, Mississippi, I could ride my bike anywhere I needed to go. The school was one block away. My grandmother's was one block away. My great-grandmother lived across the street from her. Nine of my classmates lived within a three-block radius. If I wanted to venture a few blocks further, I could find most of the rest of them. For me, 722 Marion Boulevard was the center of the universe, and I liked it that way. The gray house with all the windows in front was a strange one, to be sure. My brother remembers it as having the best backyard in the world, but I had a much stronger bond with the library, I mean, excuse me, with the driveway. The original owners were way into their RV and built a massive concrete driveway. Truth be told, I had a love-hate relationship with that driveway. Anytime my parents really wanted to punish me, they made me sweep the thing. If you don't understand that agony, try sweeping pea gravel off a wide expanse of concrete in July in Mississippi. 
One summer I had to sweep that driveway every afternoon for three weeks. Side note, I think that was a downfall of mine and my father's relationship. But I'll keep going. <laughs> I thought the punishment is excessive. Sweeping gave me way too much think, time to think about all the injustice of it. And on the other hand, the driveway was my entertainment and social center. My dad put up a basketball goal right away. It wobbled for years before he, because he was far too frugal to buy a bag of concrete mix. The red Mississippi clay eventually steadied it, which was a good thing. Rob, Eric, Ronnie, Little Frank, Richard, and I played three-on-three -three games almost every day after school all through that summer. From the top of the key, the big crack in the driveway was the free throw line. The little crack was the out of bounds on one side. The Japanese magnolia marked the virtual boundary on the other side. I've stayed in touch with Eric, but long ago lost that connection with the others. On the rare occasions when I've seen one of them at the grocery store or at church when I'm back home, my initial inclination is to run over, give them a big hug, and start trying to catch up. But I don't. I guess too many years have passed, and I get the feeling that those guys may not remember the hours upon hours we spent shooting hoops. I beat them most of the time, probably. <laughs> um, or if they do, they don't remember our driveway days the same way I do. We moved when I was 16, but my parents didn't stay gone long. Once I left Mississippi, I came home to 722 Marion Boulevard going home to the house where I grew up was a beautiful thing. A few years ago, my parents bought a small farm and moved to the country, but they still kept the house on, with a giant driveway until last week. This was in 2006. I think we all cried when they finally sold it. I understand the family who bought it has children. There are so many things I can tell those kids about that house. The way you can jump up and hit the attic pool when you're walking down the hall, the secret hiding place in the bathroom closet, the way condensation collects from the living room windows and sets the stage for water droplet races and mornings before school. But there are even more things I could tell them about that driveway. Stop like that. Thank you so very much. Absolutely. I think we all enjoyed that, didn't we? And, uh, are you the historian? <laughs> I have a little gift for you from the Writers Guild. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And thank you so much for coming. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming, Jane. Absolutely. My pleasure. Do you want us to take a picture of, of that? And then I can just send it to Ellen? I think so. Well, well, well. Stranger, where the hell have you been? Well, good luck with all of your writing. Something stuck. Didn't you start a little library? I did, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I have a lovely little library. Here we go. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I don't know why. Or hard. Oh, Busy. Well, good.